Alright, today I've got another rogue tech guide for you, this time over weapons, specifically just the basics. So, every weapon has a few particular stats. Obviously there's tonnage and slots. There's the weapon's type, such as ballistic, support, energy, and missile, which correlates to the hard points that are available on a mech. And uh, each weapon also has damage, stability, heat, and then range increments. So I guess I'll start this off pretty systematically with uh, tonnage. So the tonnage of a weapon obviously matters a lot whenever you're trying to build a mech. Um, the, the higher tonnage weapons tend to have higher damage. But the thing that you really need to pay attention to whenever it comes to tonnage is how much damage per ton and how much damage per hard point the weapon does. So for example, in this Atlas, it's a 100 ton mech, so it has a lot of tonnage available for weaponry. It can afford with its two ballistic hard points, four energy hard points, one missile hard point, and one support hard point to spend more tonnage per weapon. It's much less concerning for a assault mech how much tonnage each weapon is taking as compared to if you're looking at a medium mech like say the line holder here it's gonna have to be a lot more careful about how much tonnage it puts into each weapon so for example with its two missile hard points in the arm if you drop in clan SRMs you're gonna run out of hard points before you run out of tonnage but if you're dropping in, say, MRMs, I mean, that's 12 tons. That's the majority of the weapon payload this medium mech is going to be able to have for one weapon. Now, it does do 200 damage, so the, the damage per ton for the MRM-40 is better than, say, an IATM. Because in order for the IATM to be comparable, you'd have to drop two IATMs in. Well, actually that's an ITM-12 and a 9. So 21 missiles of IATM clan is 12 tons. But it only does 168 damage as compared to the 200 of the MRM-40 for the same weight. So those took up two slots as compared to one slot, but the damage was lower per ton. So I'm not going to get into the specifics of the different weapon types. Uh, that'll be a separate video. But it is just, as far as tonnage goes, uh, tonnage and slots is whatever the mech can facilitate. And obviously the smaller the engine core, if you've only got a 125 engine core in the Atlas, it's going to have a ton of tonnage left. Just an absolutely insane amount of tonnage left for weapons, but it's going to be crawling around. So it's going to be moving at one hex move, one hex sprint. However, you will be able to pile in a lot more heavy weapons than you would with a more reasonable core, like say a 390. So, obviously, the tonnage matters more so with, in regards to what kind of equipment you have reducing the tonnage of the mech. So, if you do have, say, Faro, Indo, and an XL Clan engine, you're still going to have ample room, ample tonnage for weapons. But the more things you drop in that take up slots to reduce tonnage, the more you're going to have to pay attention to how many slots the weapon takes up. For example, a pair of Gauss rifles. You have plenty of tonnage for them in this particular mech with these particular components. And they, uh, they fill in the hard points very nicely. So that's 24 tons worth of weapons taking up 8 slots. So if you have Heavy Pharaoh, for example, you're going to be a lot more slot-locked 
And this is, of course, without any heat sinks. So, again, slots slots are very... It's a balancing act between how many weapons do you have, how much cooling do you have, what things do you have reducing your tonnage, etc., etc. But say you wanted to throw a turret mount in with the two Gauss rifles. All right. However, you've now got almost 25 tons left to fill up and you're running out of slots. So then you'd want to go for a small slot item, like say uh, ERPPC that has two slots, still weighs six tons, but now you've got the cooling problem. So then you're starting to throw in heat sinks and each heat sink is going to take up slots. So you have to pay attention whenever you're building to make sure that you don't run out of slots, you don't run out of tonnage, you don't have too terrible of heat efficiency, you have to make sure you have ton tonnage for ammo if the weapon takes it. So in this particular example, throw a double vent of Gauss, which would be 10 shots per Gauss rifle, so you might even want to throw in an extra ton for another four shots per Gauss rifle. So you can fire both Gauss rifles four or 14 times. And then you have the PPCs. However, your heat efficiency is pretty bad. You're running out of tonnage and you're completely out of slots. Like there's, there's no way with this current setup to make this mech efficient. Because it is now slot locked, it has five tons left. The cooling isn't great. Like, whenever you're whenever you're dealing with the weapons, you have to pay attention to all these different factors. Whenever you're just trying to slot we uh, slot weapons into mechs, um, it is worth noting that earlier in the game, smaller damage instances, but more of them is better than big pinpoint. So like Gauss rifles are good once your mech warriors are, are able to actually land the shots. But if you have a choice between a Gauss rifle with a 15% chance to hit and say, for example, that uh, MRM-40 with a 15% chance to hit, you're going to be doing a lot more damage each round with 40 missiles, each one having a 15% chance to hit than you are with the Gauss rifle that's either going to completely miss or hit. So <clears throat> those are the considerations that you have to take whenever you're looking at the tonnage, slots, and damage of a weapon. Uh, stability, I find, is really only significant if you're looking particularly for a build that's going to be knocking people unsteady or down. Uh, the, the best weapons for stability per ton is uh, ballistic weapons and missile weapons. So with the exception of PPCs, energy weapons are generally pretty bad at uh, doing stability damage. So you can see up here, stability damage 2.8 times 3, 5.5, 13.3 for the large heavy laser. And the stability damage is really not the reason you want to take uh, energy weapons. So generally, energy weapons, other than the PPCs, are much better at just doing damage per ton. However, they do generate more heat. I'll, I'll go into more specifics for the different types of weapons in their own respective videos. But uh, general rule of thumb is missiles and ballistics and PPCs are good at hitting people with high stability damage. So if you want to knock people unsteady, if you want to knock people onto the ground, those are generally the weapons you want to go towards. High damage instance is better whenever you have low accuracy, so especially early game. Missiles are your friends, and big pinpoint like PPCs and Gauss rifles and auto cannons are a lot less reliable. So you have to keep that in mind whenever you're building, especially early game versus late game. Just because something seems like it does a ton of damage, it only does that damage if it hits. So, in addition to the damage and stability, there's of course the heat, which the, there's a cooling video that I've released, so if you want more info on heat efficiency, 
check that out. The only thing that you have to keep in mind with weapons is how much heat they're generating. So, basically, in in my opinion, there are three main breakpoints for heat efficiency. There is adequate cooling, where the weapons you have are within, say, 10. Let's, let's just do an example here real quick. The dual ER PPCs, they require 90 heat to use every round. So right now with the 60 cooling, that is a heat delta of 30, which means you're gonna overheat every time you fire both your PPCs. So that's absolutely no good. If you start putting in heat sinks, you can bring it down to the point where it's adequate, which is anything in my opinion below about a 10 heat delta is adequate heat, uh, adequate cooling. If you're in a uh, a cold environment, uh, any any environment that increases heat sinking, like the jungle or like uh, polar maps, then if you have adequate heat sinking, you'll be able to fire every round in those better heat sinking maps. But if you're ever in a hot map, you're just you're just gonna have to keep one of your weapon systems off all the time if you have adequate cooling. So if you're keeping in mind which mechs have how much cooling, you can choose which ones to drop on different different missions based on the amount of cooling available in the environment. Uh, the next step up from adequate cooling, in, again, in my opinion, is where you have... Well, actually, that's... You know, Protos, Protos is a bad way of doing this. Let me just... Let me just drop this and go for doubles. Let me get up to... Do, 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 do. So yeah, there's there's some adequate cooling. So there's a, a four heat delta. So every time in a, in a new heat neutral environment, you're gonna be firing both your weapons, both both PPCs every round. So every round you'll be generating four net heat. And overheat threshold is generally around 30. So you're going to get to that heat threshold pretty quickly. Um, it's just going to be a couple of rounds before you start overheating and having your mech slow down and having, you know, heat problems without anything, without any incendiary or hydro or anything hitting you just in the case in the course of regular fighting your heat will begin to build if you have any kind of heat delta now if you keep cooling you can get to the point where you're heat neutral which is where your alpha strike and your heat sinking is equal so that means that any in any normal map like say an urban map or just a open highlands map you're gonna have enough heat sinking to fire your weapons all of the weapons every round and unless you get hit with any kind of incendiary or hydro or etc type of weapon you'll be able to just indefinitely shoot the problem is whenever you start dropping into high heat maps like uh, i believe lunar and martian and uh desert are the worst defenders then you're gonna basically have to keep a weapon turned off because it greatly reduces your cooling. So that's where having a heat surplus comes in, which generally it, around 10% of a heat surplus is fine, is, is actually like optimal. So in this example, the, the heat delta is negative 14. So there's a 14 heat sinking surplus. That means if you drop into any hot environments, like the desert for example you should still be able to fire all your weapons every round now on cooler maps like especially like the polar map you're going to be wasting tonnage on heat sinking because it's it's not going to be relevant you're you're going to have spent what is that uh so right now there's a heat surplus or a sinking surplus and 
So yeah, there's two tons on a regular map, on an urban map, on a highlands map, etc. You'd be wasting two tons there. And if you're on a polar map, which I think increases heat sinking by 10%, you could actually drop another two heat sinks and on a polar map still be heat neutral. So it's just whenever you're building like you can you can mess around with heat sinking and how much heat delta you have and then choose to drop particular map mechs onto particular map types based on how much cooling they have if you want to play it that way if you just want to have the same mechs drop every mission all the time then your choices again like you can have heat neutral mechs that just have to be cautious whenever they're in a hot environment you can have overcooling mechs that just don't care what kind of map they're in at all and are just always good to fire every round all the time. Or you can even have mechs that run hot and just keep in mind that if you drop them into a desert or lunar or Martian environment, etc., that you're just going to have to keep a weapon turned off all the time. So those are the different ways you can deal with heat. And then, other than that, the the primary things to pay attention to with all weapons is the range. So, minimum range, if you're within the minimum range, then you are taking a massive, uh, massive accuracy penalty. So, you can see movement, four hexes is about 100 meters. So, having a zero meter, well... Okay, clan clan PBC is a bad example. It doesn't have a minimum range. Um, let's go with LRMs. Just standard, regular. Oh, here we go. Long fire, even better example. So long fire LRMs. Let me get one of these heat sinks out of there. Long fire LRMs have really long range, 960 meters. But they have a minimum range of 210, which again, that's around eight or nine hexes. So if you're within eight or nine hexes with long fire LRMs, you're taking a massive accuracy penalty. The difference between uh, the, the distance between minimum and optimal range are the best hit chance available. Like if with long fire LRMs, if you are anywhere between 210 and 480, which is uh, I believe it's around like eight or nine hexes to like 16, 17 hexes, big, big swath. Then you have the optimal hit chance with this weapon. And then anywhere between optimal and max, you have a smaller hit penalty. It's not as much of a penalty to hit as if you're within the minimum range, but there is still a small penalty to hit compared to the optimal range. And then anything beyond the max range, which in the case of these Logfire LRMs is 960 or, uh, what, what is that, around 40 hexes? Is that, is that right? 4 hexes is 100, 100 times 10, yeah, so around 40 hexes. So anything within 40 hexes you can shoot at. Like, you can shoot at. doesn't mean you'll hit, but you can shoot at anything within 40 hexes. So, then you get to more standard weapons. Like, oh, I don't have any regular auto cannons. Okay. Well, let's, let's look at the LBX-5 then, for example. Oops. So, the LBX-5 here has a minimum range of 90, which is around 4 hexes, 3 or 4 hexes. So anything within three or four hexes, you're going to have a absolutely terrible accuracy penalty. But you will be able to shoot. Anything over 900 meters, which again is an insane number of hexes, you will not be able to shoot at at all. And the, the optimal range is, again, between 90 and 450. That's where you'll have the best hit chance. And uh, with with the auto cannons, it's a good example of another thing you'd have to pay attention to with weapons is some weapons have what's called recoil. Recoil does not impact the accuracy at all for the first shot. However, 
recoil applies every round that you try to fire immediately following a round where you fired. So if you don't have any recoil reduction on your mech warrior or your mech, and you're bringing this LVX-5, you can fire, turn it off, fire, turn it off, etc. The entire fight, no accuracy penalty at all. But because it has a recoil of one, if you try to fire every round, you will suffer an accuracy penalty because of the recoil. Now, weapons like this Ultra Auto Cannon 10, for example, this has three recoil. You fire, and the three recoil just means that you have an absolutely wrecked hit chance if you try to fire again without recoil reduction. The higher the recoil, the higher the accuracy penalty, but but uh, the, the best way to deal with recoil is either fire, turn it off, fire, turn it off, or just build into your mech or mech warrior's recoil reduction. Um, other than that, there's also jam chance on some weapons. So if the weapon jams, it becomes unavailable until it unjams, and the chance to unjam is based on your uh, mech warrior's gunnery skill. Uh, I believe at 10 gunnery, you're guaranteed to unjam, but you still have a chance to jam. So even with maxed out gunnery, you can still jam. It's just the jam will last no longer than one round. So if you fire and it jams, then the next turn you won't be able to shoot it, but it'll unjam at the end of that turn. But then if you have less than 10 gunnery, then there's a chance that it will not unjam and it could stay jammed for multiple rounds in a row, in which case you're wasting tonnage because you have a weapon you cannot fire and uh, that's just obviously not good. So jam chance and recoil are two things to consider across weapons. And uh, let's see, that's damage, tonnage, slot, stability, heat, range, jam, recoil. Is there anything else? I mean, obviously, accuracy penalties and accuracy bonuses are very self-explanatory. Um, I mean, I guess clustering is something to talk about. So if you have a weapon with a lot of small damage instances, whether it be missile weapons or even the ultra auto cannons that fire two rounds or uh, pulse lasers, the the chance of the damage hitting the same component is based on the clustering modifier so if you fire anything that has a lot of damage instances or even just multiple damage instances the odds of those damage instances hitting the exact same location are based on clustering so the first check that is done whenever you fire a weapon is to see what location well okay if i want to be really explicit when you fire a weapon, the first chance is the or the first check that the system does is to see if you hit. And missiles and pulse lasers and things, each instance of damage gets its own chance to hit. So it calculates how many hits or how many of the damage instances hit. Then it checks to see what location was hit based on the available locations, based on whether you're shooting from the back or the flank or the front or whatever. And so then it picks out a location for the first hit. And then from that hit, the clustering modifier is what determines how many of the damage instances hit the same location and how many scattered to hit adjacent locations. So I hope that helped explain weapon basics pretty well. Uh, I will be doing follow-up videos that go into more detail of each t uh, weapon type, including comparisons between members of the same families, the energy weapons, the ballistic weapons, the missile weapons, the support weapons, etc. But uh, for now, I think that uh, that covers it, and um, until next time.